Um, right, well, it's a great privilege for me to introduce John Konevsky. He read, he said he studied, I think so what you studied at Exeter. <laughs> All sorts. Um, well, I, I went to Exeter University as well, but um, he was a few years after me. Um, I'd graduated by the time he started, became a tutor in economic history. I don't know whether that's um, our old friend Minchinton. It certainly was under Walter. And a award of the PhD eventually on the diffusion of power technology in Britain, 1760 to 1870. He started is at that time to compile um, a uh, what has now become, I suppose, started off as a card index, has now become a computer on the web database of early steam engines in Britain. Um, oh, maybe not just Britain. Uh, just Britain. There's a few in the continent. Um, so um, he then moved on after Exeter to join the National Coal Board, then joined with the uh, NHS um, Communication Director in Oxfordshire, and then returned back to I won't say his first love, but I don't know what, uh, researchers and tr on his retirement. As an honorary fellow, fellow, he continues at the University of Exeter. And his researchers now focus on 18th century steam power, especially the fusion of the Newcomen engine. And we both spoke on the bill at the recent second early international engines conference, which was held at uh, the Black Country Living Museum about two months ago. Yeah, so over to John for his talk, The Industrial Steam Power in London, 1780 to 1805. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, I've never done one of these things where I've both got an audience in front of me and online before. So I'm going to be a bit more formal than I normally am. I'm going to kind of more or less read my paper, um, which is a mixture of things. It's, it's obviously has a main focus on the history of technology, as that's why we're all here. But it's also got some economic history, a little bit of population history, some statistics, and um, maybe a bit of controversy in terms of uh, what I always call hagiography, but um, may, people may disagree with that, and we could perhaps get uh, oh, there I am, uh, perhaps get on with that uh, later on. So, tonight's agenda what we're going to talk about today is London's role in the early industrial revolution. Um, I'm going to talk about what we actually mean by London in this context, because that's not exactly always clear. I'm going to talk about what power London needed. I'm going to talk about Bolton and what rotative engines and their rivals. I'm going to talk then about the spread of steam engines, the numbers uh, of steam engines built in London, which unusually or almost uniquely, we can actually triangulate against the survey, which was done by the adolescent John Ferry in 1804-5. And I can compare that with the, all of the data, details I've compared, compiled on individual engines painstakingly over 40 years. Um, but also because of the 1805 survey, I've taken my usual that's finishing date of uh, 1800 on forward to 1805, which also is, is, is interesting because we then get into what happened after the end of Watts patents and, uh, and Richard Trevithick. So, there is a debate, I suppose you'd call it, um, in the extent uh, of uh, the Industrial Revolution in London, was London important or was it trivial? It, it, um, a man back in the 1920s said that the Industrial Revolution passed London by. Um, and that was a kind of accepted for a while, but certainly in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been quite a lot of research done by, by various London historians and economic historians and, and technical historians about whether that's true or not. And the consensus is clearly now that it, that it certainly isn't true, that London was really important in the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, I'll, be, I'll try and prove that over the course of the uh, over the next half an hour or so. So one indicator of industrialization and the technological changes that, that go with that are is the rate at which steam power was taken up 
in, in, that, in this particular period. And I always define the, the, the key period of the Industrial Revolution as basically coterminous with the, the French and Napoleonic Wars, because that's when things really started to accelerate. I don't take it back to as early as 1760 or so, but that's, that's just my, my preference, I guess. And as uh, David said, many, many years ago, I published a, uh, a paper with, with John Roby, who first started the project, collecting details of, on five by three record cards initially of every known engine, and we've taken that forward. And in the last 20 or 30 years, it's been transferred to an Excel spreadsheet and very considerably expanded because of all the additional uh, resources you have through the internet and elsewhere um, to know where, um, where um, how many actually engines were actually built. And one indicator of, um, of that for me, for me, and something that John and I mentioned in the original paper in 1980, was that London was an area which, in which relatively little research had actually been done at the time, and where obviously more research would be invaluable. So as part of my work of, of updating and expanding the, uh, the database, um, which as David said, is available on the internet, um, I've been looking at London and um, adding every reference I could find to industrial um, steam engines in, in the capital. And uh, when I came to look again at the Fairy database, I then was posed with a problem because the database obviously looks at engine building. It's a, it's a uh, database of, of erection of engines, not what happened to them afterwards, because it's absolutely impossible to try and follow individual 2,500 individual engines throughout their working life. We have details of a few of them, but I think not enough to make the, the, stati the sample statistically viable. Um, so Ferry's survey obviously was a survey of engines in existence then, and mine is an engine, a survey of engine building. And of course, existence is not the same thing as persistence, as a colleague, scientific colleague of mine once already said. So, to, with that caveat, it is now possible to, to do um, the, the comparison. And so I've been looking at um, all of the, uh, the engines we can find, but the, the problem is of always, of course, is that um, you get led by the data. And there's so much more data on Bolton Watt than anybody else. Uh, it's very easy to be um, overwhelmed by the fantastic resources, uh, records and what have you that they left. Uh, but whereas most of the other engines built by other people have left almost no records. Um, and particularly in the period we're looking at, um, often they were semi-portable ones. They were increasingly becoming more sophisticated technically. And so it gets more difficult to follow them through. But nonetheless, the current state of knowledge does enable, enable us to, um, to show some interesting light on the process. And um, one, year, one, one thing I've learned over the, over the years is never assume that any historical uh, record or whatever is complete and irrefutable. And as I said, we do have this, um, this um, uh, fairy survey, and I'll come back to talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna spend quite a lot of time this, this time comparing um, what's known about Bolton and Watts engines with what's known about other people's engines. Um, and basically what I'm gonna conclude is that um, although steam power was less intensively applied in London in this period than, than the classic Leeds, Manchester, iron, iron working coal mining areas, nonetheless, um, London was an emerging powerhouse of industrialization. And, um, and use steam power much more extensively than, than it has hitherto has been generally recognized. Uh, basically because London had a problem, which we'll, I'll come on to talk about in a minute, in that it had very little access to other sources of power. And of course, um, horse mills could provide power up to, a, up to a point, but it was limited by costs, by logistics and, 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 and other reasons. Um, London also was a good market for Bolton and Watt because coal was more expensive in London than it was in, in the industrial areas for obvious reasons. It all brought in ships down the East Coast from, from Newcastle, Sunderland and, and elsewhere. And um, so that gave Bolton and Watt's engines an initial early advantage because they were more efficient because of the fabric condenser. And in the early years, they were better made than any of the other engines. They, uh, 
what's um, uh, development of uh, uh, the uh, uh, brain gone uh, of, do of, of um, engines where the, both the 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 upstroke and the downstroke of the piston were, were powered, um, and double electric engines gave more more smoother and more compact power, which was important in London, particularly in the the areas where already. Um, space was a premium. A lot of, um, of, uh, of, of, of companies were, were in very small premises, and um, that, was a, that was a factor. Um, however, the ascendancy of Baltimore was nothing like other, the, the many other historians have, uh, have, have assumed, partly because, as I say, Baltimore left so many records, people think that, and they were assiduous in promoting this idea that they had a monopoly and uh, Etc. Etc. John Law wrote that you know that nobody else was allowed to build steam engines after what that kind of thing that still persists. Um, um, even even recently, a very very otherwise really good mo monograph on the use of horses in London in the Industrial Revolution assumed that Bolton and Watt produced all the steam engines that were used in London in this period. So the other question we have is 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 what is London? I can work this thing again. So, London uh, wasn't a fixed thing. I mean, who decides what's London and what isn't London? For the, this purposes, I've had to make some choices, and I just find it as, I, as in, the, in the slide there. City in Westminster, the East End as far as the Lee and the River Lee and Stratford, the Thames along, the, along west to Brentford and the, uh, the River Brent, the South Bank, Bank east from the Wandle, where the Wandle came in in Wandsworth, and the the uh, the industrial areas the the metal bashing areas of Lambert and Southwark along the along the uh, along the Thames to Deptford and if you look at that's probably what London was like in 1805 this is in 1806 but who knows you know when the thing was actually actually drawn you can see that if you I don't know if any people know the rock map of huge rock map of London done in the 1740s London expanded hugely in this period. And areas that we uh, that we kind of consider to be the central part of London, like for instance between Oxford Street, Regent Street, and the Euston Road, had only recently been been, been built up. And uh, also, there, London was expanding south of the Thames because new bridges had been built down into ones to Lambeth and Southwark, and uh, down as far east as Greenwich. Now, there's been disagreement about how much London was. An industrial city. Um, I'm not going to go through all the historiography. Anybody that um, is interested, I can provide some sources. And uh, I guess many of you know the works of uh, Schwartz, Barnett, uh, and others that have been writing about this um, in in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and they have more or less disproved and um, Barnett, in particular, by looking at um, the directories and insurance records comparing the 1770s with the 1820s, shows how how big and wide a range of industries were going on in London using many of the new technologies that, that, that we're going to talk about in the next, in the next few, few minutes. Um, so despite the common narrative that London, the Industrial Revolution happened in Manchester, Leeds and the coalfields, um, it's at least arguable that London was the most industrialised city in the world in 1800, 1805, and certainly the most varied industrial uh, structure in the world in terms of the, the range of industrial activities that are going on. Nowhere else had as much going on as London did. And the reasons for that are fairly, fairly, fairly obvious. London was the biggest place in the world. Um, Manchester may have had more steam power, but um, London just was, was just so big that it, um, it needed and sucked in industrial power and uh, capability. And as that, uh, expansion took place. They needed more power than the small number of other uh, other facilities could provide. Also, London had had, had um, some considerable numbers of, uh, of of steam engines already before then, uh, which I'm not going to talk about tonight because other people have, have, have talked about them extensively. Uh, but um, just to give you an example, London in 1700 had, had about 600 population of about 600,000. By 1800, it was probably a million. The next biggest city in, in England, Manchester, was less than a tenth of that size. Edinburgh was a quarter of that, uh, was, a, was a 20th of that size. 
So that's the kind of thing. And even the other large industrial, uh, large capital cities in the world, like Paris and Naples and, and other such places were, were only half a million or so. Beijing is probably the only other place in the world that had a population to rival London's in 1800 or so. Um, and we can get some, some kind of fragmentary views into what that meant in terms of what the demand for industry and, and other activities in London are uh, from, from, local, from contemporary sources. There was a wonderful book published in 1802 called The Picture of London, which gave a, a, a fascinating snapshot of what was actually going on in London at the time. Um, this, this reckoned that there were 8,000 small craft going up and down the Thames, 3,500 larger ships going in and out of London, traveling around Britain and around the world, um, 40,000 wheeled vehicle movements every year in London, 30,000 horses to, to achieve that, and vast amounts of food and other consumables that were needed to, um, to, uh, to feed the needs and water and houses and everything else that, that London has needed. Um, so, I, of course, many of these things are probably no more than informed guesses, but they are, they are kind of, as far as you can tell, consistent with what else we know, because we know, for instance, quite a lot about production of beer, wine and spirits in London because of Peter Mathias's fantastic um, uh, book that he wrote in the 50s on, uh, on uh, the brewing industry in London and the, the fantastic records that some of the big brewers have left and also because of excise duties, which is the only really reliable source of, uh, of statistics one have about anything around this, this period, because one thing the government needed was money and the way they got their money was by taxing everything they could lay their hands on. So, um, and also beginning at this period, we've got some very reliable, or not reliable, but fairly comprehensive directories coming up. And I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute. Um, and from, from those, from, we can reckon that in the early 1800s, 1801, two, three, four kind of period, there were about 15,000 industrial enterprises of one sort or another. Some of them very small ones, you know, just a man and, um, and, a, and a wheelbarrow or whatever or whatever, but some of them quite large enter enterprises and particularly, obviously, the big breweries. Um, 70 million gallons of beer, 11 million gallons of spirits, 7 million gallons of wine were drunk by people in London in the, uh, in, in the early 19th century. And it's reckoned that every adult ate on average a pound of bread a day or a little over a pound of bread a day. So perhaps 400 pounds of bread a year with, with a million people, you, you know, do the math as they say in America. And huge amounts of coal were coming into London um, 9, 930,000 Winchester children, so that's about one and a quarter million tonnes of coal brought into London uh, a year in this period. Uh, and we know that's fairly reliable because of work done by my former colleague, uh, the late great Professor Flynn and, uh, and David Stoker on the, the volume of the cobalt history before mine. Uh, now, not obviously a lot of that went for domestic heating and other purposes, and some of it was re-exported and taken up the river and, and down on water, but, but a lot of that was used to power steam engines. And uh, all of that activity needed factories to produce it. You couldn't produce everything that was consumed in London just on little small artisan enterprises. And by the, the 1780s, coincidentally, just at the time that um, applying steam engines to produce rotary rather than just uh, reciprocating power was, was, was happening, was exactly the time when, when London was getting beyond the capabilities of other sources of power to provide. So what other sources of power are we talking about? Oh, just, just before I move on, I normally talk a lot about new carbon engines and as with this new carbon, I couldn't resist putting this thing, which I know David has criticized as being not the best representation of this particular thing, but this is the famous Chelsea Waterworks with two new carbon engines. And water was, of course, the first thing that London needed that anything other than steam power couldn't provide. You know, with 600,000 people going up to a million people, more and more of them having the wherewithal to pay to have decent quality water. Um, the, the big London waterworks um, and uh, the great, late, great Henry Winner and Dickinson wrote a wonderful book of it, which was actually published as a New Coburn Society, extra, uh, whatever they call it, extraordinary publication back in the 50s, and, uh, which I struggled in vain to find an affordable copy of. If anybody's got one, I'd be very happy to borrow it. Um, anyway, um, other sources of power. 
we're talking about get this thing to go forward. Oh, now this is jammed. Ah, oh, there we are. Other sources of power. There are there are there are other other ways of, of generating power. Obviously, the wind, water mills, horses, and human effort. Um, there were a few windmills in use around this time. Here, if I can get it to show, is um, quite a famous mill long gone in, in Lambeth. Uh, and there were about five or six windmills working in Lambeth around the time, mainly um, before the, the one that survives at Brixton Hill, actually, that wasn't next to the prison, wasn't actually built to 1816. But the problem with wind power, obviously, is, as those of us who are critiquing energy policy at the moment realise, it's intermittent, unreliable, and capricious. Um, London, because it's an estuary, and fairly flat, um, had limited access to water power. Uh, obviously, everybody knows the, the, the wheels that were underneath the, uh, underneath the arches of London Bridge that were pump water, but again, superseded by the need for Newcomen and then Bolton and Watt engines to pump them. But there were a few tide mills. This is a very famous one. This is two mills complex in, 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 on the River Lee. This is actually a later building because the original building burned down in 1799 and they rebuilt it in 1806, as you can tell by the, the design of the windows. It's, it's not an 18th century building. But, and they also had a windmill there as well. But that's, that was the biggest of the tide mills that, that existed. And there were a few water mills, um, but mainly not in what we would now call London, in the Wandle in the Brent and in the Lee Valleys. And the Wandle uh, is particularly famous for its, its water power. Although, um, as we'll see, again, as we'll see later, it did actually have, have an early use of, of steam power as well. Horses were a, were a much bigger contributor. Come on. Ah, there we are. And this is a, a horse mill um, Typical of the kind that uh, which, I, which uh, I have to admit that um, I'm not as knowledgeable about on, but there is a very wonderful book recently been published uh, by a man called Elmeroff Williams about London as a as a uh, the horse driven society or whatever, and of course horse mills were providing the impetus for industrialisation, particularly the breweries, long before steam engines were. Um, and also a wide range of other industries were using them for grinding, bark and um, milling and, and all sorts of things. And um, the large porter breweries that, uh, that, uh, that Matthias wrote about, we transitioned from horse mills to water mill to, uh, to steam engines, mainly Bolton and Watt ones. Um, and although the horses that uh, drove these things were often very uh, badly treated, they were often old and blind, knackered horses, but they were still very expensive to run because they needed food, they you know, needed to get rid of the waste products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was reckoned at the time by some of the big breweries that, it, that the, they were spending 40 pounds a year, we can multiply that by 100 for modern money, um, a year on each old blind nag just, just to keep them going. And of course, because they were old and blind nags, they didn't have a very long uh, lifespan left. And so the capital cost of replacing them all got very young, all got very young. So the time was right for steam power. And uh, if I can again move forward. Come on. There we are. So the time was right for steam power. And as a, a coincidentally, this was exactly the time that rotary engines were starting to be produced. As I said, there was insufficient water and wind power in London, and people then, uh, started saying, all right, we need to, we need to use uh, steam engines to do this. But there was a lot of concern in these early days uh, about whether the engines could be made smooth enough. In Manchester and Leeds and elsewhere, and to a little limited extent in London, that was gettable around by using savoury engines, small uh, basic pumps just to pump water up, up and up, over around and around over a water wheel. I've mentioned the cost of coal, and um, we we're just talking a minute about the time scale of practicalization. Also, all of these factories and uh, factories generally around the country in the days before iron frame buildings were very vulnerable to fires, not just from the the, the boilers of the engines, but from the processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this was a time when there was a huge amount of technological development going on. 
Um, so we then need to ask ourselves who needed sophisticated engines and who, for whom other engines that were less technically advanced, so-called, um, but could do their could do the job. Um, so 1779-80, as uh, John Townley, uh, colleague of ours, and David uh, heard me and me and him talk about this at the um, at the conference a few a couple of months ago. Um, was just exactly this time that um, that um, the application of the crank to turn reciprocate into rotary power was starting getting started up, and uh, James Watt um, didn't use the crank. He invented a thing of his own called the Sun and Planet in, uh, Drive, which I guess many of you, most of you, probably know about. And the reason for that is quite simple. He, the, somebody else had picked, uh, patented it, and he was absolutely petrified that if he challenged somebody else's patents, they would challenge his. So uh, he didn't. He um, he didn't. And in fact, um, Sun and Planet, even though the uh, the patent on the crank expired and was pretty largely ignored, actually, round 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 the country, or even though that patent expired well before the end of the century. Voldemort still continued to build sun and plant engines until into, into the first decade of the 19th century. I think the last one in London was in 1803. So, but the first rotary engine that was even was, was actually planned to be built, or the first one that we can be sure about in London, was actually countermanded because John Smeaton, the foremost engineer of the times, was not enamored by the, by the idea. He, he'd seen that the early experiments with, of, of, with using rotary power were not very, um, not very smooth. And so he wrote a report uh, to the HM Bittling, I can never say that word, Bittling board, and the text of that, I apprehend that no motion communicated from the reciprocating beam of a fire engine can ever act perfectly steady and equal in producing a circular motion, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all the fire engines that I've seen are liable to stoppages, and that's so suddenly, et cetera, et cetera. So, timing, of course, is everything in, in technological change. And this wasn't an unreasonable opinion in 1781. The people who'd been building, trying to apply rotary power, obviously without uh, dub, uh, double acting engines and uh, uh, what's parallel motion to keep the, the piston going up and down in a, in a, in a, in a, in a plane. Um, although this wasn't an unreasonable opinion at the times, so, um, um, within a very few years, this was pretty much out of date. Technological change was happening really fast in the early 1780s. Uh, and um, crank engines had already been built in several places in London and elsewhere that were working perfectly good. And it was really only the most delicate of operations, particularly um, spinning cotton and then later later wool that, that it was it was really really that critical um horse mills were not steady because the horses might suddenly stop and everything so the breweries said to themselves well all right yeah okay but steam engines can do us do, do uh, perfectly well what we want them to do grinding malts and pumping water up to the top of the brewery and everything and everything and so they started buying um Bolton Watts engines and i'll come on to that in a, in a, in a minute um and Bolton Watt did have several advantages at the time. Um, they, um, they obviously they had better engines, um, and the, the patents were uh, were uh, were a, a huge advantage to them. But they weren't perfect. And um, James Watt, in a rare moment of um, of self analysis, wrote to John Wilkinson, the famous man who made his. Um, Made his cylinders in 1788. So this is six or seven years after we, you know, after the the first engines had started being put in. When engines of our constructions are not carefully attended and kept in order, they may burn more coals than a common engine that is well kept. Now that is not something you read in any of the James Watt biographies. Now I, I mentioned briefly a, a moment ago um, uh, savoury engines. Let me get this thing to work again. Now we know of at least one savoury engine that was built in London. This is Mr. Keir's axle tree factory in uh, what's now Camden. Um, and this is the only diagram in theory uh, for the famous book of the thing, but we, I, I found quite by accident a few months ago, an actual drawing of one, uh, an actual painting of one, which is in 
was in a worsted mill in Bedworth in, um, in uh, whoops, go too quickly for me, I'm good. In, uh, in Warwickshire, very near to Griff, where the second or third, depending on whose um, analysis you believe, was built. And so this is a, a worsted mill, and you can see this is just a simple uh, cylinder sucking water up from the bottom of the water wheel back to the top of the water wheel. And I suspect there were quite a few of these in London, although we have no records of any of them apart from the one that was in the Axel Tree factory in Camden. It maybe there weren't many because the topography wasn't really as, as suited to them as, as, as perhaps as the, the places where there were more, more water mills with uh, overshot or rest shot water wheels. But anyway, um, so as I said, improvements in engine design, metallurgy, manufacturing was going, very, going on very rapidly at this period. And um, by 1780, yeah, 1784, Bolton and Watt had sold um, the first of their brewery engines uh, to Goodwins, uh, much to Whitbread's annoyance because he wanted to have the first. Um, and um, more, more of these followed very quickly, particularly to people, as I say, the perfectly steady motion that, that Smeaton was talking about wasn't so important. And uh, the high cost of coal in London if you were making big profits like the breweries were, was, was, was less of an issue. Um, and other people were also making cheaper, less sophisticated um, engines at the same time. We, we know of several that were put in around the same time that Watt was putting in his first engines in, uh, in the breweries. Um, Bolton Watt papers talk about several experiments in, in 1781, 82, 83, although I'm suspicious of those, but you know, but we know definitely that um, that um, in November 1785, a rotary engine was for sale at a Mr. Law's um, snuff works in London, and snuff was a big, big commodity at the time, grinding the uh, the stems of tobacco plants for and uh, with thick end of a million people, um, half of whom were male, and a third of those were adults. Um, they got through a lot of snuff, um, and um, Cameron, who's better known for building uh, engines to wind coal up in the northeast, uh, also um, sold, built two engines at a furniture workshop and another snuff works around this time. But the brewery engines were the were were the big um, were the big uh, the big demand, and the early Bolton and Watt engines looked pretty much like this. This is the lap engine which was used at, um, at the, the Soho Bolton Soho factory and is um, been preserved, but. You can see from this with the sun and planet gear and the wooden thing, and they're quite small, fairly simply built. In fact, Bolton Watt didn't build steam engines. They designed them and, and built, made the, the, the delicate bits, the, the, uh, the valves and the, the tabits and that kind of stuff. But all the rest was put together by craftsmen and foundries and metal metallurgists and brickwork, bricklayers and all sorts of people up and down the country. And, what they basically did was put together a, a group of people. They were like a cross between architects, consulting engineers, and um, and wholesalers basically. And it was left to the uh, to the um, to the customer to build the thing, usually with a uh, an erector that had been sent by Bolton Watt to help them do it. And sometimes it took ages and ages to get the things to work. Um, you can see a very basic uh, wooden beam, two or three pieces of oak, um, a handmade. Um, crank all of the uh, uh, sun and planet gears and everything so all in all they they weren't as sophisticated um uh, as all that um and also um what's my point all oh, right so and also the, again at this time some fairly basic crank engines were being produced and this again is a illustration from fairy and it's seized up And that's roughly what, what, a, what a small crank engine was. Not that similar, dissimilar to the Bolton Watt engines, but obviously without the, well, I'm pointing at the thing, which is a fairly stupid thing to do, uh, without the double acting and without the parallel motion, I think. But, but basically, they, you know, the, the, the thing is, so, so if you didn't worry too much that the, the, the crank might go around a bit jerkily and it might suddenly stop from time to time, um, this thing that cost half or less than half what a Bolton Watt engine cost, um, might do you perfectly well, and for many of them it did. So, the breweries though led the way, and um, 
most of the, with a couple of exceptions, most of the big brewery, the big porter breweries in London built steam engines in the, in the first 10 or 15 years after, um, after the, um, the, the first installation. Uh, not all of the golden white engines, though, by any means. Um, there's, there's a, I can document at least five engines in breweries that were built by other people. Uh, and the biggest one of the lot in, in this period, bigger than any of the Baltimore engines, was a hornblower engine, the famous uh, inventor of the, the compound engine that Bolton Watt managed to uh, stamp on, shall we say. Um, and most of these, as I say, were fairly small engines in 20, 15, 20, 25 inch diameter cylinders, not very big, six foot stroke, four foot stroke, um, and um, only producing six or eight or 10, horse, 12 horsepower which is all you needed to replace 50 horses, because don't forget horses don't actually produce horsepower and they can only do it for three or four hours out of six hours, maybe at a, at a time. So to, the Brink Brewers were able to replace dozens of horses with, with one steam engine. But as I said, um, general industry was also using, um, um, starting to use uh, steam power. And I, I built up over the years, um, quite a lot of records of um, from sale particulars from, a wide variety of sources, um, um, quite a quite a lot of details, and some of those obviously we know um, didn't didn't last very long, but others of them were were working well well past the end of our period. Um, so over the next over the decade between 1780 and uh, 1790, we can document about 60 engines being built, built in London, 31 of them by Bolton and Watt, and 29 by other makers. Um, and these were in a vast array of industries. Flour milling obviously was one, because London had an insatiable appetite for bread, but uh, cotton mills, woolen mills, iron foundries, um, surprisingly large amount of iron working going on in London, particularly immediately south of the river in Southwark and Lambeth. Um, and, um, uh, starch milling, uh, seed milling, a lot of uh, oil and mustard milling, because uh, oil, and, uh, oil and mustard were used extensively in, in food production, and uh, just a huge range of other things. Um, and Bolton and Watt was supplying some of those, but a lot of them were being, being done by, by rival manufacturers. But of course, we know much more about Bolton, what Bolton and Watt were doing than anybody else. Uh, and then in the next decade, even more, this, uh, this is true even more, um, and by 1800, um, there were a, there were a, a lot of engines, a lot of engines in London. Uh, and it, as I said at the beginning, after 1800, when Bolton Watts' patents expired, um, there was a, a big spurt in building very small engines for for uh, so in, industries that previously hadn't thought it cost effective or necessary to have a steam engine. Suddenly, they they became more uh, more 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 feasible because they could be built cheaply um, to a much higher engineering standard with all the improvements that were going on with Maudsley and other people developing uh, machine tools and lathes and what have you to make these small, mainly metal, mainly iron engines um, that were cheap and efficient and, and uh, thing. And so between 1801 and 1805, I can identify another 36 engines that were built just in those four or five years. Um, and 12 of those were Bolton and Watt engines, but interestingly, 24, twice as many, were by other people. Um, and we know this from, from what's been written about Trevithick and what's been written about, uh, and also the, um, the wonderful results of the online British Library record of all the, the, the two main London newspapers, the London Post, sorry, the Morning Post and the Morning Chronicle. So, including the, um, the brewery engines, I talked about, uh, mentioned earlier, and here's a list of them. And you don't need to bother to, to, to kind of, it just, it, it just illustrates the, the size of the, what's going on. So the early ones were all Bolton and Watt engines, but then other people, Simington, famous Scottish uh, engineer who worked with Karen, uh, a man called Weston built, uh, built one, Hornblower, as I mentioned, and two or three other people. And some of these, the, particularly the, late, the later period, um, the, the Lion Brewery, Parsons and Gardiner are, are, are breweries that don't feature heavily in the historiography. And this is something I'd love to have the time to do more work on, and maybe I will if I'm spared, as they say. Um, so again, we go forward. Let's summarize where we are. So this is the steam engine building. And as I say, 
building is not the same thing as in existence in 1805. And what I've been trying to do is to work out as best I can what might have happened to all of those engines. Um, and uh, as I say, oh, if you put that all together, in total, I reckon, in, including some ones that are, that are doubtful, these ones that are called possible in the, in the, in the, um, in the parenthesis, well over 130 steam engines have been built in London. Uh, and this doesn't include ones pumping water in dockyards. It doesn't include the, um, the waterworks engines and what have you, which were a whole other category in which somebody else is going to have to do the work on. However, as I said, we can have a stab at looking at what happened in London uh, what, in 1805. And also we can take some account Again, because the Bolton Watt records are so voluminous, what happened to some of the ones that didn't survive to 1805? This is the uh, famous Albion mill that caught fire in 1791 with two large Bolton Watt engines. They'd actually, been, uh, I hadn't realized until recently, they'd actually been planning to have three engines, uh, but they never got around to putting the third one in when the thing burnt down. And, and John Rennie, um, who was the, uh, the mill right, Scottish millwright that had been employed to work on it, famously said that he didn't think it was an act of arson, although other people had their suspicions. And all the flour millers in the Wandle and Lee and Brent Valleys and up and down and the windmillers wind in Kent and Essex and everything, did a little jig of delight when the Albion mills burned down because they were seriously undercutting them. Um, and for the Bolton Watt engines, again, because their records are so voluminous, we do have some idea of, of how many of the engines that didn't survive. So I can document in about 10 that were either moved or burnt down or whatever in that period out of, well, I can't remember how many was I said that built them were built in the whole period, uh, 70, you know, uh, 68. So maybe one in one in six or one in seven of the Bolton Watt engines haven't survived. And for a lot of them, we, we know definitely they were still working from, from newspaper robots, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, and, as I said, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Um, so the fact that we don't know whether they're working on or not doesn't necessarily mean they weren't. Um, and um, although we've got very little information apart from sale adverts for the non bolton engines, we can have a fairly good um, we can have a fairly good um, good look at that. So what I've done for this purposes tonight is to assume that any engine absent evidence to the contrary that had been built after 1790 was still working in 1805. All oh, right, that's a heroic assumption, but it's the one I've made. Um, and a small number that we can trace as still being at work in 1805, mainly Bolton and Watt ones. Um, um, we can kind of say, all right, we know that one was working in 1805. And uh, as I say, we can triangulate this against Ferry survey. Now, John Ferry was an amazing man. His treatise on the steam engine published in 1827, it's kind of still the definitive work on the subject. And uh, the second volume, which he never actually got around to publish, but David and Charles were able to find the proofs and complete with his um, manuscript uh, corrections and, and publish those as a second volume of the, of the thing. Now, as a 13 or 14 year old boy, he was a bit of a prodigy. He went, he, his father, of course, was the author um, who wrote the um, book on uh, Derbyshire and what have you. He managed to persuade Bolton and Watt to let him go round and, and do measured drawings of a lot of their engines. And they were used in, in various things, in Reef's Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Britannica, all sorts of things. And um, he stated that the author visited all the establishments in London and in the immediate neighbourhood in 1804-05, that's in and believes that the above list comprises all the engines that were then used in London. And lo and behold, here is the list. Now that compares the fairies list with what I've got on my on the database. Um, fairies, despite fairies, com fairies confidence in the accuracy of incompleteness of his, um, of his things. And as I say, he was a prodigy, but he was only a 13, 14 year old boy. Um, he clearly didn't go to all of the uh, all of the um, all of the uh, enterprises that had steam engines. And although he probably drew London in the immediate neighbourhood, quote unquote, uh, more narrowly than I've done, um, because I've included in the database engines in places like um, Merton and the Wandle and up the Lee Estuary and, and uh, a couple of those kinds of places. Um, 
and he, uh, he clearly missed most of the um, or many of the small non Baltimore engines in in in, in through the East End and, and uh, in Southwark. Um, for instance, as you can see from the, he didn't include any sugar works, although Bolton what actually built some engines and sugar works. He didn't include um, quite a lot of the uh, of the um, of the um, in, in, uh, things in um, um, distilleries um, in all sorts of areas where. I mean, he said there were only two cotton mills in working in London in, in 1805. Well, there were at least four, and I think probably five. So if you compare the two, what you get is that um, um, there's about 14 engines that fairy covers that I haven't been able to track down, but about 30 or so in my database that he clearly didn't survey, or or maybe I've assumed more of them that were at work than, than were. But, Here's how you look at it. My overall best estimate is that around eight, around 100 steam engines will work in London, narrowly defined, the, the area of the built-up area in, in, that, um, the, in the, the map that I showed you earlier, and perhaps another 10 or more um, in, in, in the, the, the river valleys to the, to the western northeast of London. And further work can may, may well refine that. Obviously, I'm going to carry on working on it, but... Um, the other thing that, um, that the fairy database doesn't um, uh, really reveal is that, um, as I said, um, increasingly the other engines that were being built were being built other than Bolton Watt. Now, this is a few years later. This is a, a, one of Fairy's drawings in Fairy of, um, Bolt, of a Fenton Murray and Wood engine in 1810. But the engines that, that, that standard of engineering excellence were already being produced in, in 1800. And in fact, Fenton Murray Wood was so good that Bolton Watt sent people to spy on him, to steal his green sand casting technology, and then bought a piece of land next to his, in, next to his works to stop him, expire, stop him compete, uh, expanding, because they were so petrified that they, he was actually making better engines. And if the word got around, uh, it might reflect badly on them. Um, and just as, as an example, um, Bolton and Watts first started producing um, uh, iron beams in around 1800, but other people were already doing it then. Fenton Murray of Woodwork and um, uh, Heslop in, in Cumbria had built one in either 1799 or 1800, one of his twin engine twin beam with, a, with an iron beam. So uh, Bolton and Watt were still at the, uh, at the forefront of new technology, but they were no means in control of it. Um, Bolton and Watt did use the, oppor the, the opportunity of this expansion and demand for small engines to make some small engines. This is one of what they called side lever engines. This is uh, the one that's in the Science Museum Reserve Collection, I believe. Um, and uh, they'd only sold four or five of these in London because either they couldn't compete or they decided the market was not profitable enough to, work, to be worth bothering. But these kinds of engines then had a resurgence later in the 1820s and 30s uh, in small uh, steamships. But the big, the big uh, player, of course, was Richard Trevithick. And this is one of his early, um, early, um, uh, early high pressure engines, again from Ferry. Uh, this was the one at a, at a factory in, um, in um, Vauxhall. We know very little about, uh, about these early engines, except for what's in Trevithick's letters, which have survived in the Cornwall records. And um, his, uh, and uh, his grand his son or his grandson's life of Trevithick, but the de details are often very sketchy. Uh, and a key fi key figure in this 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 thing was a man called David Watson. And I know I'm running running over my time, but this, this is um, this is something that I think of, should be of more general interest. These are two letters that Trevithick wrote in nineteen in 1804. The first one is in his hand in his spelling, and the second one has been um, what's the word improved. Um, and he said, there are now, there is now 12 at work in London where they've established their utility. And if you wish to see the engines, go and see Mr. David Watson, the steam engine bit maker at Blackfriars Road. Um, and David Watson is an interesting character, which I'd love to know more, love to, about whom I'd love to know more about. He was an engine builder. Um, his father got him into apprentice. He was from Glasgow. His father got him apprentice to Bolton and Watt. And he went down to Birmingham, worked for Bolton Watt, was sent down to Cornwall and did help erect quite a few of the, the um, Bolton Watt big, pump, big pumping engines there. Then went to London. And then for some reason, we don't know why, he had a big falling out with Bolton Watt and set up on his own. And he established that, um, that factory in, uh, whoops, gone, gone too far again. He established that factory. And as you can see at the bottom, it says, 
Watson David, steam engine maker and millwright, Blackfriars Road. So this is Kent's directory in 1803, and the same entries are in the post office and other directories around this time. So he seems to have been a terrific agent in London, and uh, Ferry does agree that several uh, terrific engines were erected in this period, most of them presumably by Watson, although at least one was done, were put together by a Mr. William Rowley, whose, um, whose engineering works were in Fitzrovia, um, which at that time was a kind of new developed area of uh, mixed use, not the, uh, the uh, what can we say, the upper class area it later became. Um, and um, I can detail five of those 12 engines, assuming the 12 isn't, uh, well, it may be an exaggeration, but it clearly isn't a, a, a wide ex exaggeration. However, Trevithick was pulled up short when one of his engines exploded, or the boiler of it exploded, and um, this was explained that the, the the engine boy who wanted to go fishing, or some some reason that's unclear, uh, stuck a piece of wood on top of the uh, top of the safety valve, and the thing blew up. Um, and of course, Bolton and Watt were absolutely delighted. This was perfect evidence for Bolton to say, "Oh, it's not safe to build this uh, these high pressure engines." And um, Trevithick did get round it by putting a fusible lead plug in, so that there was a fail safe in the boiler, but um, of course, the damage had partly been done. And uh, as um, Trevithick Ferry 20 years later said, that uh, Trevithick was able to obtain some orders for high pressure engines in London, but not so many as he would have received, as the explosion at Dulwich had not deterred many persons from adopting his engines. Uh, and um, so there we go. So even allowing for some scepticism, um, um, Trevithick were, was building uh, engines in London. But the trouble with Trevithick, of course, is that, as is well known, he was an extremely difficult person. He left no business records. He had no idea about how to enforce his payments, he, his patents rather. He really needed a Matthew Bolton, really, to, to run, his, run his business and, and get on with the inventor. But he didn't have one, and the rest, as we know, is where we're going. And also, I've got a couple of engines in the database built by Brahma, the, the man famous for, uh, for um, locks and other, other road designs. Uh, machine tools and quality ground, what have you, and the uh, the uh, the Brahma Press. Uh, he was also a, a steam engine manufacturer. He had his his, uh, his factory was at number fourteen Piccadilly, which is an interesting thought. Um, and one of them was for sale at a, a factory in Merton in eighteen o four. And he we definitely know that he built one um, at the dockyards, uh, the Royal Dock, uh, the uh, uh, Woolwich Dockyard, or was later become Woolwich Dockyard to run a plate a plate pioneering planing machine, which was really important and is part of the engineering design that eventually led to the, the development of the crosshead, which is a really important but un, unrecognized bit of the history of technology. But that may not have started work till um, after Perry had completed his survey, so we probably ought to, uh, we ought to, uh, ought to discount that one anyway. But Trevithick, of course, was important for these things, railway locomotives. And I've argued elsewhere that everything that Watt did, much brilliant though he was, was all in incremental technology. Nothing that the Bolton and Watt engines did couldn't be and was done by other the engines built by other people. But for railway locomotives, you, you needed high pressure and you needed puffer engines. And all right, Bolton and Watt and, Sme and uh, Stevenson, what have you, uh, get most of the credit. But um, as uh, our colleague in the back there says, um, it's got the T-shirt that proves it. Richard Rivithick was an important man. So to conclude, and I'm sorry for going on so long, London was a major industrial city. There were about 100 or perhaps more stationary steam engines that worked there in the early 19th century, depending on how you define London. Bolton and what were the biggest player produced nearly half of the engines that we can document, but others were more important, or as important anyway, although so much less is known about them. And London was an early test bed for high pressure engines, which laid the foundations of the great Victorian railway boom and many other things that, uh, that, that we know about from elsewhere. And that's it. Thank you very much. So. Questions? I guess. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that no. is via the chat on uh, the I'll, I'll also take corrections and um, what's the word disproving if anybody 
can show anything I've said today is wrong, I'd be very happy to put right, because this is a collaborative uh, enterprise. The database is only, it was only ever made possible by the work of hundreds and hundreds of people. So the old um, saw about standing on the shoulders of giants definitely applies. So questions. Thank you, John. That's, that's really, really interesting indeed. Um, and I don't have any corrections or things to prove wrong for you. As, but I do have a question. A hundred stationary steam engines would require a lot of people. Yep. Um, and so a couple of questions. When those people come from, how they run, how were they trained? And were the engines kept going 24 hours a day? At least double the number of people required. And how were they trained and, and things like that? We know relatively little about the training of people other than the people who were employed by Bolton and Watt. But um, Bolton and Watt had huge difficulties recruiting trained staff and trained a lot of them up themselves, like the man David Watson, who I was so, And I'd be really interested to know why he had a falling out with them and set up on his own. But there were five or six other people who styled themselves as engine makers or steam engine makers in London in the early 1800s. Um, I was just sent recently a re really interesting link to a, um, a, some work in a PhD about millwrights and the, the, the combination of the millwrights who connected the steam engines to the machinery uh, were, was, I can't remember all the details, it's not really my field, was, was part of, or if not the main reason for the passing of the Combination Acts to stop um, people, uh, you know, uh, the millwrights uh, get, bargaining together early form of unionism to to argue for better pay better pay and wages and it was the same in manchester there was a huge shortage of of, of of people with the skills to do this and the technology was changing so fast this time you know from the, the simple and crude newcomen type engines to the sophisticated murray and wood and um, and and Trevithic engines and the standards of the, the improvements in metallurgy and machine tools and the stuff that were going on partly driven by um, the uh, the uh, the boom of the Napoleonic Wars is, to my mind, the most under-researched bit of our industrial history. But nobody knows where all these people came from. A lot of it was just was just um, people learning the hard way, basically. Bolton, even Bolton and Watt, they built loads of engines that they couldn't make to work, and then they would have to send an experienced guy, a Murdoch or uh, or somebody, you know, one of the one of their well-known people to help the people out or to get the thing to, to work. And, and before the building of the, uh, the Soho foundry, um, it, factory rather, in the, the engine works in uh, 1795, they didn't actually build steam engines. They, built, they, they designed them and, and provided some of the parts, as I said earlier. So how they got the people and, 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 uh, and got them work, working together um, is, 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 is not at all clear. We know about some of them. There was a talk to the, um, um, uh, about um, the, uh, the guy who... Um, Built some of the Crofton engines and about his um, his background, and I guess these people just you know were taken on as 14, 15 year old boys by and and and, and learnt you know the hard way basically because there were no well until John even with John Kerr's um, you know manual on building steam engines that didn't really help if you were building a small three or four horsepower engine in a factory in London they were you know colliery pumping engines and until until much later there was very little in the way of textbooks as it were. Is it actually very clear why the boy did it? <laughs> Was Watson connected to Oscar and Lloyd, who were the contractors employing the boy? I don't know the answer to the second question. Um, you may know more about it than I do, in which case I'd be very happy to be um, uh, updated and corrected. Uh, the, the story is that he, he did it to go fishing, but whether that's true or not, we don't know. Uh, in, the daily working, working of engines. Um, some of them did work 24 hours a day, but not many. I mean, it depended on, on what they were doing. and what have, But most factories, you know, like um, uh, metal working and what have you, wouldn't, wouldn't work overnight. Uh, it would just depend on the, on, the, on, the, on the amount of work they had on. Thank you very much.
Well, the Trevithick engines worked at 30, 40, 50 uh, um, PSI. Bolt and Watt engines are five or six or seven at the most. But again, it's it's um, it's related. Again, it's related to the improvements in in, in engineering and metalworking techniques. Before, say, the 1790s, it wouldn't have been possible to build boilers that were sufficiently robust to do the work that Trevithick regard, relied wanted them to do. But improvements in in um, in, in the design of boilers, uh, which again is slightly outside my field, although I know a little bit about it, I'm not really an expert on it. Um, by by 1800 or so, it was possible to build boilers that could sustain those pressures because they, the the, um, the process of making the, the plates they were made up of, the brickwork that they were encased in, the um, the, uh, the the connections, the valves, you know, um, the, some of the early ones failed because the solder melted. So they say, um, you know, in the, in the early days of the Newcomen engine. So this was a period of fantastic um, coming together of new technologies, uh, metallurgy engineering, screw making, quality control, precision engineering, uh, a whole whole raft of different things just all happened to be happening at the same time. Now whether whether the, the you know it was like a self-reinforcing um, kind of um, what do they call it when, you know when the um, when everything is all, all works together by accident or whether it was um, through hard work and, and whatever and whatever who knows. But um, uh, um, Musson and Robinson did some fantastic work in the 60s about, about what was going on in Manchester with Bateman and Sherrod and some of the other engineers are there and about the training and the same issue Rob had actually about the people who built, who made the, the, the spinning and slubbing and whatever machinery. There was a huge shortage of people to do it and how, uh, how they were trained and how they were recruited um, is, 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 um, is not always clear, I should say. <laughs> For the for the Trevithick engine, yes, combination. the combination of the two. The, the, not, the Trevithick's engines wouldn't have worked without the boilers, and obviously they wouldn't have built the boilers um, without the need to, to, to for the high pressure engine. So it's a kind of a, a, a what do they call it? Um, it's a it's a self reinforcing process. Okay. Okay. Well, I, 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 the answer to that is I'm working on an, another paper at the moment about um, what's happening elsewhere in the in, in the country. Uh, it's, it's developing a, a, a talk I did to the um, the James Watts by. Uh, 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 bicentenary conference in in Birmingham a couple of years ago, there were roughly similar numbers, but again, it, it depended hugely um, where 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 you, the rest of the data. I only, I only stop in eighteen hundred, so I have no idea what was happening in Manchester, being in the early part of the of the nineteenth century. Because it's not something I've worked on. I've only worked on London because it's possible because of the the, the fairy thing. Um, Bolton Watts patents expired, or well, technically in June eighteen hundred, but effectively, you know, you can't. Do things to that level of, um, of detail. Um, in the 1790s, about a thousand steam engines were built up and down the country. Now, again, goes back to the question of who the hell built the things, who the hell maintained them, who the hell fired them, who the hell repaired them, who the hell did all the other things that were necessary. Because, as I said, building an engine is one thing. Running it for 15, 20, 30 years is another different, another thing entirely. And as we know from the uh, the the Bolton White engine at um, in the museum at uh, at Sydney, the one from Whitbreads, um, what's left, what's there now, is very little of the original engine is there. It's it's, uh, it's a bit of you know a grandfather's shovel. You know, I grant this is grandfather's shovel, but I replaced the blade and my father replaced the handle, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, it was in fact mainly, mainly silk. There were two at least making woolen yarn in the East End. Well, silk. Which they 
some of which, yeah, but the, the, the large scale making of silt and uh, silt mainly moved out of the right. Um, All right. Second silt mill would you still there? But they were they were hand they were hand powered. Well, um, well, just let me let me let me look through. Um, I bloody have as well. Yeah. Um, the Woolen Yarn Company in Lambeth had one uh, with a bolt and what in a Symington engine actually in 1793. That was definitely still going in the early 19th century. Um, there's the, uh, well, there was one in, um, that was a wool and silk mill in, um, that had to move because of the building of, of the Catherine's docks in 18 or something. And there's a, 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 a report of that in, in, in the press. Um, I can't remember where the other ones were offhand, but, uh, there definitely were woolen mills and, and four or five cotton mills as well. Um, in Bethnal Green and all sorts of places. One in one in um, Brick Lane. Um, it's just that because nobody nobody's bothered to go through the London papers before, and nobody's ever found them before. But I'd be very I'd be very happy to be put right about the silk industry. It's not my. Fault. I don't think any of them were had bought the engines. No. Well, I know about the Derby silk mill, of course. Um, when, when was when was that built? Right. All oh, right. I'd be, well, that may it may well it may be, maybe they did have a steam engine. Uh, I'd be interested to follow that up. It may be that they did have a steam engine. Who knows? Well, yeah, well, most of them were. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly, and also just slightly to the uh, to the east of the uh, armaments industry, um, you know, some of the big clocks that were being made in this area, the churches and that, have mechanisms not dissimilar to the control mechanisms on uh, the sort of more than what engines of the earlier Newcomen engines. And indeed, and in, in fact, in, in Manchester, particularly in that area, they, they, they made the distinction between millwrights' work, which are the things that connected the engine to the drive chains, and the clockmakers' work, which was the things that actually, the people who made the actual spinning and the jennies and the mules and all that kind of thing. It was still called clockmakers' work well into the, 20th, into the 19th century. So I take that point entirely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was why they were able to move yeah. down there because of the bridge. That's also where the Rennies have their works. No, the um, um, literally by later on. Originally he was in Piccadilly. Rennie. Oh sorry, I'm yeah, I'm getting confused. Yeah, yeah no, Rennie. Rennie, Rennie, Rennie yeah. Work, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah. But Rennie Rennie, 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 Rennie but Rennie didn't make steam engines. No, no, no. no. Oh yeah. Another steam engine made that in black drive of one engine survived. What date was that? I'd have to check on it. Oh, well, if that was before 1805, that's another one to add to my well, list. No, right. Probably about that time. What's interesting is that um, Watson disappears from the directories exactly around this time, and nobody knows what he did, although it's possible that he went on to, it went into the, um, to the, the downstream because one of the, one of the engines there was, the company was called somebody in Watson, and it may be that guy, or he may have died, or whatever. Indeed, absolutely. And um, as I say, carry on. All right. Well, I'd be very happy to be uh, to be put right on that. Absolutely. No. no going going back to the mill rights, as I say, um, this um, PhD that um, uh, I kind of knew about, but um, John Nailing, um, 
um, reminded me about. Uh, there's some, some, some stuff about Rennie recently been published on the Mills um, uh, Index uh, website, and there's very interesting stuff. Uh, and this guy's PhD about the combination, the the kind of the like the prototype trade union of the millwrights. There was a man called Cooper who did a lot of the work for the for connecting the Bolton Watt engines to the brewery and other uh, work. There were two brothers, I think, uh, called Cooper. And, um, that's something that now I know about it, I should be following up. It was the remark that David Perrett has just made about the uh, same screws and the water supply. Uh, these engines, although they were quite low powered, were not very efficient. They required quite a lot of water. They did. So, um, well, you know, do you find a tie up between water supplies and the engines? And I'd also go back to earlier when you were talking about horses, because horses too require a lot of water. They do indeed, absolutely. Um, have you looked into this side of it? No, not really. But I, I kind of one knows for, uh, kind of generally that um, um, water supply was a big issue in London. As I say, it was one of the, you know the first steam, the first couple of dozen steam engines built in London were to pump water from Chelsea and uh, uh, Tem, uh, Blackfriars and London Bridge and waterworks to um, to supply the needs of, of Londoners. Now, most of this was pretty crappy water because a lot of it was being pumped straight out of the Thames. But, of course, the, uh, the one at Sadler's Wells, that was um, uh, better quality water. And, of course, a lot of the people, the water table in most, much of London is quite, quite close to the surface, or it certainly was then before, you know, since in the 19th century, the, the water table has been going down and down because more and more has been abstracted. So I guess these people could just put down a well and, and um, either use a crank, something off the engine or, um, or, or a, a horse wheel with a crank to pump water up, because the crank had been known since time immemorial. Um, this idea that, uh, you know, Bolton and Watt used the Sun and Planet engine because... Yeah, we'll find the, yeah, anyway, uh, so it's not an area, not an area which I'm particularly knowledgeable, but certainly um, um, how, pe how poor people got their water. And uh, of course, that relates to cholera and all that kind of stuff in the 19th century from contaminated water and everything and everything um, is a whole other area, uh, one which I fear I probably haven't got the resources to get into. <laughs> Stratton and Sainsbury's and there's not a river nearby. Well, you've actually got, well, there used to be a water supply on the heights of Stratton Common, um, uh, being a sort of, uh, well, what do you call it when you, you get water for health purposes? The reservoir? Spa, spa really yeah. Well, Beulah Spa, near, friends of mine live virtually within view, viewing of where Beulah Spa was, but that's yeah. water coming out of the green sand, isn't it? Um, it's um, under hydrostatic pressure, I think, from memory. Yeah. And of course, there were lots of small rivers in London. I mean, near where my friends live in, uh, in uh, Harold Road in, in, uh, in Crystal Palace is the, is, is the spring from which the River Ephra runs. And that's obviously what's been covered over over the years, but it ran all the way down through Brixton, Ephra Lane, across the Stockwell, where the Stockwell pumped water out, and, and came in underneath where MI6 now is by uh, by Vauxhall. And you can see the outfall underneath the corner of the MI6 building, which was blown up in two James Bond films, of course, uh, through CGI rather than in real life. Uh, you can see where the, where the River Ephra comes out. And all, like the fleet, which went, ran underneath um, uh, Marlebone uh, High Street, you know, Marlebone High Street is one of those few roads in London that goes like that because it was built on top of the river. And the, the rivers are there. Is it? Oh, Fleet Street. Well, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there the were, the were, the were rivers, but they weren't big enough to drive watermills. Yeah, you'd think so. And particularly if you were. Uh, in the, the early ones that I was talking about, those savoury engines, all you needed was a few gallons a minute to just pump it round and round and round. So that's my, why I'm wondering if there might have been more of those, because they solved a problem. <laughs>
Indeed, well, not for condensing the provisions, but absolutely. And of course, it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter as the day went on because it was being. Not the actual water that they actually use, which actually say goes round and round. Yeah. It's the water for the condensing, which is the issue. And you can't let that get too hot because people will start complaining. And they did. Said, and they did, yeah, yeah, no, I agree entirely. It's just it's 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 kind of an area which I'm not an expert in, so I hesitate to to say more than I've said, basically. But all of these things, you know, every, as soon as you get into dealing with them, it leads you into wonderful, wonderful um, side turnings and, uh, and crossroads and things. And, you know, when you're reading the, eight, the 18th, and late 18th, and early 19th century newspapers, it's really easy to get diverted into, you know, things about runaway apprentices and people whose wives had run off and we, I will not be responsible for their debts anymore. And she was wearing a green pinafore and stuff like that. And it's all fascinating stuff. You could spend... You could spend your whole life reading the Manchester Mercury online. John Lloyd's Blackfriars Memorial describes them as a millwright. Fascinating stuff. I'd like to know more about the millwrights, and as I say, I'm gonna gonna delve in. I can't remember the na name of the guy whose PhD um, he's, he's published a, a kind of a section of it online on the mill rights, um, uh, the uh, mills database thing. Um, his name is something like Moa, M O H E R, something like. That. Anyway, there's there is a lot there is there is work out there and kind of because it's a lot of it's being done by people who aren't kind of in our area of of concentration. You tend not to know about it unless you unless somebody tells you about it. And I'm sure there's a lot more that can be found out about some of these engines that I assume must have been there, or that I don't know when they when they when they how long they work for. But it's a, it's a it's a lifetime's work to follow them all through. I mean, it's bad enough for a hundred in London, and I've got two thousand five hundred in the database. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But also, I have seen that the wood at the powerhouse is in in steam as well. It does work on the steam. This is a grandfather's axe. It's an absolutely massive grandfather's axe. It stands twice as high as the engines in the science museum. Absolutely, yeah. It's an amazing I went there a couple of years ago. Society, and they said it happened, you'll get engineered. It wasn't normal to see, but they said they'll get engineered. It's something we can find. You can come and get the thing. I think it is. So that was a really fascinating. Um, there's a lot more to find, I'm sure. A lot more that John has pointed out the role of engineers and engineers. Thank you very much. My